Jim Thompson and Stanley Kubrick met sometime early in 1955. Um, they were an odd couple in that Thompson was at least 20-something years older than, than Kubrick. Kubrick was born in 1928. Jim Thompson was born in, in 1906. Um, moreover, um, Jim by that time was a kind of courtly southern gentleman who seemed a lot older actually than he was and Kubrick was in his in his late 20s and in all their meetings with with Stanley Kubrick the Thompson family characterizes the director as a as a young beatnik that's how they thought of him and they couldn't believe that he wasn't wearing a tie and a jacket when they would go to restaurants because that's something that Thompson always did Thompson was coming off his most successful run as a, as a writer, um, starting with his affiliation with Lion Books in the, in the early 1950s. Um, in the period from about um, 1952 to 1954, a 19-month period, Thompson wrote and published a dozen novels with Lion Books, including many of his most famous works, like A Killer Inside Me or A Hell of a Woman. And Kubrick apparently had read those books and admired those books, particularly The Killer Inside Me. You know, he, he gave Thompson a, a quote that's now become famous about The Killer Inside Me, that it's the most chilling and, and convincing account of a psychopathic killer ever written. And I think that's as true now as it, as it was then. But Kubrick also needed Thompson. Kubrick had just directed Killer's Kiss, it's a brilliant movie in many ways. It makes extraordinary use of New York City locations, terrific cinematography, but it doesn't have a, a strong script. You know, it doesn't really have dialogue and, and language. And I think that what Kubrick must have been looking for is the qualities that he found in, in Thompson's novels, and that would be this extraordinary American dialogue and the ability to render characterization, subtle characterization, subtle psychology through dialogue. Um, he must have been attracted by Thompson's kind of mastery of various American vernaculars. But I think also, given what Stanley Kubrick was going to do with the killing, with that kind of complex structure that keeps coming back to moments in, in time and specific places, he, he must have thought that Thompson could bring that to the project also. It's the structures of Thompson's novels, you know, not just the plots that probably most appealed to Kubrick at that moment. You know, the way that a novel like A Hell of a Woman ends with alternating lines of Roman and Italic type, each, each ending is kind of strange and, and violent as the other, or the, or the way at the end of The Killer Inside Me, Lou Ford blows up the whole world, or, or even more extreme in a novel like like Savage Night, where um, a character either is or imagines he is on a, on a farm in, in Maine, and the woman that he's brought to the farm is actually hacking him to death with a knife. And as the mutilation of his body gets more extreme, so do the mutilations of the, of the chapters. And the strange structure, I think, of uh, Clean Break would have uh, appealed to Thompson as well because it was a, a curious mirror of these self-consuming structures of his own books. Thompson, at the moment that he met Kubrick, um, was simultaneously at the, at the peak of his career and one of the nadirs in a way. He had just published 12 novels in, in 19 months. Um, some of his best novels. But his editor at Lion Books, Arnold Haino, had just announced that he was departing the company to become a freelance writer. And Martin Goodman, who presided over magazine management, the company that owned Lion Books, said that he was probably going to get out of the paperback industry. So Thompson was actually entirely at sea. Um, he had just taken a job as a copy editor at the Daily News. He was supporting himself otherwise with true crime reporting, something that he really hadn't done for almost a decade or more. And um, there's a real sense in which Kubrick rescued Thompson. 
as far as I can tell, this was Thompson's first experience with writing uh, a screenplay. He had tried to crack Hollywood as, as early as the late 1930s with, you know, various stories, I- ideas, or, or his early proletarian fiction, but, and nothing had, had come of it. And my sense is that Thompson and Kubrick worked on the script very closely almost every day in an office on West 57th Street in, in New York City. And Thompson, although he lived in Queens, spent a lot of time when they were working on the screenplay living in a nearby hotel so they could work on the script um, more and around the clock. And the sense that I have is that Kubrick would sketch out the scenes that he wanted, and then Thompson would go off and construct dialogue and story out of the the scenes. I think there's a lot of Thompson in The Killing, even though the plot and the unfolding of that plot does follow the book rather rather carefully. He stitched little signatures of of himself into the the screenplay. You know, one of Thompson's favorite phrases at, at that point in his life was, what's the use of kicking? And he gave that to the policeman, Randy Kennan, at, at one point. Good evening, Randy. Uh, things been. What's the use of kicking, Leo? You wouldn't believe it anyway. Oh, I suppose... Thompson introduced a lot of um, subtle and sometimes extremely moving changes into, into the screenplay. One was to give Michael Riley an ailing wife, a sick wife, rather than a trampy, slutty daughter, the way it is in the novel. And I think that the scenes between Mike and his and his wife are among the most tender in the in the movie. I'm just not hungry. Really, I couldn't eat another bite. Another? You haven't eaten anything yet. Well, I'll take something after a while. Thompson, in a lot of ways, domesticated the 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 Lionel White novel. The biggest change, though, that that Thompson made was to expand enormously so that it occupies almost um, center stage in the, in the film was the marriage of George and, and Sherry, Alicia Cook and Marie Windsor. And that represents, I think, the sort of relationship that you see in Thompson all the time. You know, a kind of verbal sadomasochism that's played out in at least two long, magnificent scenes that really don't have parallel in the novel. And in the novel, George shoots Johnny. In the movie, George shoots Sherry. And I think that's, you know, a a very characteristic Thompson shift. One of the ways in which this entered Thompson's personal legend is as a kind of grievance narrative, really. Thompson worked very closely with Kubrick on the, on the screenplay, and I think he was expecting either a solo screenwriting credit or at least a dual screenwriting credit. But the final credit read something like screenplay by Stanley Kubrick with additional dialogue by Jim Thompson. I think that's since been altered to dialogue by Jim Thompson in, in at least some prints of the, of the film. And the way the Thompson family tells it is that Thompson first saw the, screen, the film in a, in a screening room in, in Manhattan. And when the credits rolled at the start of the movie, he virtually had to be restrained in his, in his seat from um, exploding. I don't know whether Kubrick was in the in that room at the same time or, or not, but um, Thompson, for the rest of his life and his family, you know, for long after his death, um, viewed it as a as a total slap in the face and as a. Um, um, a misrepresentation at best of what Thompson had contributed to this film. It's, it's actually on Kubrick's part an extraordinarily sly and, and devious credit because, um, you know, most of the plot comes from the Lionel White novel. Most of the structure comes from the Lionel White novel. So most of the original parts of the screenplay that 
don't have an analog in the novel fall under the category of, a, you know, additional dialogue. And so it, so it has a, a kind of passive-aggressive precision about it that actually rivals a lot of moments in Kubrick films. I think that the additional dialogue credit, um, you know, was the aspect of the film that consumed Thompson in a lot of ways for the, for the rest of his life. But what's fascinating is that this partnership with Stanley Kubrick totally survived the, the complication of this credit. Um, Thompson went on to write the early draft screenplays of Paths of Glory. He also drafted a, a kind of novella screen treatment called Lunatic at Large um, for, for Stanley Kubrick. And he was also kind of called back a few years later to help Kubrick on an eventually unrealized uh, project called I Stole $16 Million. So that Thompson and, and Kubrick were pretty much kind of bound at the hip for about four years um, through a succession of, um, of projects. My sense is that it was an extremely tense, but for both of them, extraordinarily creative partnership. One of the ways in which I think they were bound at the hip is, um, is financial. You know, I mean, um, I don't think Thompson could have walked away from Kubrick, you know, financially. Um, but I also know that there were ways in which Kubrick treated Thompson very well. During the writing of the screenplay for I Stole $16 Million, Thompson had what, what was was the first of his strokes, and Kubrick kept supporting him through that. And even the arrangement of, with, with, with Lunatic at Large seems to have been an effort on the, on the part of Kubrick to, to keep Com Thompson going while, while Kubrick was moving on in other directions and to, into other projects. I think Kubrick really comes into his own in the, in the killing. And a lot of the work that he did go on to do after that does involve literary adaptations. It's often struck me as no accident that one of the next projects that Kubrick moved on to was, was Lolita. Lolita, in a lot of ways, is the highbrow killer inside me. You know, a, another kind of unreliable narrator who thinks he's smarter than everybody else, who thinks he's more cultured than everybody else, and has his own airtight, alibis about why he is the way that he is. I think that there's a very close connection between Humbert Humbert and, and Lou Ford. And I think Kubrick saw that very clearly. And I think he was also very interested in writers that could give him quick and complicated access to very large statements about America. And Thompson did that for him, and, and Nabokov did that for him. And, in Lolita. The killing and Pads of Glory were the, were the high points of Thompson's ex experience with movies. Shortly after he worked on these, he moved to Hollywood first in kind of fits and starts, you know, coming back to New York, going out to Hollywood, and then ultimately, you know, moved there, um, moved to San Diego, and then, and then Hollywood, where he, you know, he lived for the rest of his life. But his experiences in Hollywood, for the most part, were a succession of fiascos and disasters. He was incredibly naive, I think, about, about Hollywood. His family says that he would routinely kind of, you know, seal a deal with a, a handshake and a, and a promise and inevitably be hurt and disappointed when, when nothing came of it. But for the most part, um, his, his, his life out there was, was a, a series of almost projects. Um, and from what I can pick up is that he wasn't particularly good at meetings. Um, he had no gifts for um, presenting his ideas in kind of high concept, short form. He was a storyteller. Um, so he, you know, um, he wasn't 
in any sense like a, a kind of good salesman for his for his projects. But he saw the getaway turned into a movie, and Thompson himself wrote a, a first draft screenplay of of the getaway. And it's a very mixed bag. It um, it's it's very prolex in a lot of ways, but but there are also surprisingly these scenes that that get at aspects of the novel that um, neither Peck and Paw nor the later remake were able to you know to accomplish. There's a real way I think in which the novels are unfilmable, and I think that the directors who have been excited by them. Um, almost forget what excited them and what attracted them to the books in the in the first place so that you you take a novel like the like the killer inside me um, what's the point of filming that novel if you aren't going to register on camera or find cinematic equivalents to Lou Ford's kind of self consuming slippery voice you know the the energy of that of that novel is very much the energy of a, of a character who who is doing to the reader the same sort of things that he's doing to the townspeople. If you're not interested in putting that on screen, what you're left with is um, is a is a violent plot about uh, a Texas lawman who happens to be a, a serial killer. And I think similarly for the getaway. If you're not interested in the last fifty pages of the of the novel in which the you know the, the 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 couple that's been pulling off these crimes descends into this very strange kind of hell out of Jonathan Swift. What you're left with is a is a routine caper film. The films that have been made from from the novels tend not to reflect or even be very interested in the aspects of the novel that make them so original, or audacious, and unprecedented. And it seems to me no accident that one of the very best of the Thompson adaptations is Coup de Torchon, the Bernard de Tavernier film that, that risks moving the, the book out of Texas to territorial Africa and is willing to sort of modify all sorts of things in an effort to actually get closer to the vision of the, of the book. But in a lot of ways, I think... Um, Kubrick and the and the killing is Thompson's vision on on screen, and you see it in the sense of of loss and missed opportunities that that pervade all of the human relationships in the film, the various marriages and and friendships of the movie. There's just a kind of sadness about experience and the way that people's lives are ground up by their their yearnings and their ambitions and their and the failures of those yearnings and ambitions that that's very much Thompson. So I think it's an extraordinary moment in the in the lives and the careers of both Kubrick and Thompson.